Okay, let's start. Sorry for the delay. Um, I uh, first want to make sure that uh, uh, everyone has a project team or not. Uh, so I saw a couple of mails on Piazza where people are still looking for partners. So which one of you do not have a teammate yet? You don't? Okay, anyone else? Okay, so do come and talk with me right maybe right after the class. I'm holding office hours and I know some folks wrote to me, so I'll try to either find you a single person project or sort of get you hooked up with. Is there any team of two? Okay, yeah. Okay. So but you are still kind of deciding on the project and all. Yeah. Maybe you might want to talk talk with them and see if, okay. But come and talk with me in any case. Um, uh, okay, uh, so again, uh, no office hours tomorrow uh, and in lieu of that uh, after the class, I'm doing office hours, so just come and talk with me. Um, uh, but I do want every team to be finalized uh, like by tomorrow for sure. So whatever it takes. Uh, if you're a team of two, welcome a third person. Uh, I think that's, I, I think I would like to really avoid single person projects. Uh, and if you have a team but have not spoken with me, come and talk to me about project ideas. So um, uh, picking up where I last left off, so we were talking about uh, different kind of, different ways um, uh, sort of Vulnerab vulnerabilities in vehicles get exploited. Before that, I talked about the medical implants, so just part that sequence of case studies. So towards the very end, I was talking about how uh, the uh, embedded computing units that exist in the cars, they're all sort of tied together in a network, and very conveniently, this network, uh, this, uh, this, this priority-based um, uh, bus called CAN bus is exposed as a port in all vehicles built since late, late 90s, you know, all gasoline vehicles at least, um, and uh, uh, you can basically interface to it very easily using uh, very readily available uh, adapters <laughs> and then you can do all sort of fun stuff around that including injecting false packets, snooping on the traffic, so and so forth. So uh, literally very easy to do and uh, uh, doing, doing, doing things uh, at large scale. You can really compromise many cars in one go. So almost every aspect of a modern vehicle goes over this bus, including things like an image captured from a camera before it goes to processing on the GPU unit <coughs> will go over this bus. So, if you're persistent enough and seek to snoop at the traffic and reverse engineer it and all sort of people uh, have shown all, all these things can, can easily be done. I had talked specifically about the wireless tire pressure sensing kind of a scenario where even things that you might think are pretty innocuous uh, can be used uh, sort of uh, maliciously and so both to do dangerous stuff as well as from a privacy perspective. Probably the most interesting uh, things in recent times that people have been doing are uh, attacks around GPS. So vehicles obviously depend upon GPS and jamming GPS is uh, uh, jamming and kind of tampering with it uh, in some shape and form is uh, pretty easily um, uh, done. So the simplest thing is you just jam. It basically you kind of uh, are into a denial of service kind of a situation and that obviously uh, um, uh, creates uh, problems. Um, in some cases, these uh, you, you'll, you can find these devices which basically they market themselves from a privacy perspective that by preventing uh, uh, GPS receivers from working, they basically provide uh, thing. But they're also used for cheating, uh, cheating toll systems, uh, increasingly insurance systems, there are uh, where uh, insurance rates depend upon you giving permission to the insurance company to track you, um, uh, bypassing other things like bypassing drone flying restrictions, for example. So um, nowadays, uh, when you buy drones, they come with firmware which if you attempt to fly in an area which is for example near an airport will refuse to fly so all these kind of things like uh, depend upon valid knowledge uh, valid knowledge of um, uh, 
the location. Um, it is easy, but obviously it is not legal and it can also interfere with um, uh, a lot of very valid uses. So, jamming is one, but more interesting is spoofing where instead of simply denying the GPS service, you try to give a different sense of a location and now you can imagine that as vehicles are getting into uh, autonomy of different scale uh, uh, where they do depend upon GPS to then refer back to a map, uh, this, has, uh, uh, this has implications. So, the way these um, spoofing systems work is that they basically generate a uh, fake signal um, and uh, the civilian band is not encrypted at all. So, GPS consists of a military band and the uh, civilian band, uh, civilian signals and uh, okay and uh, so the base so basically, I mean, a couple of ways you can kind of do it. One is um, uh, you truly generate something from scratch, and the other is you can capture a valid signal from a satellite and then uh, replay it at a different different place. So it can be done. Uh, they are widely available uh, hardware at this point, and a lot of stuff is also open source. So I think between Cornell and UT Austin and I guess um, some companies, there are uh, ready-made devices. Uh, with all the design details available and all that you can do and you can also use things like um, uh, the uh, USRP which I mentioned the software defined radios to be able to do uh, this, uh, this kind of spoofing. The basic approach that happens out here is that you have a GPS receiver, it is lock, locked onto some satellite and usually these satellite signals are pretty weak. Uh, so, what you start by doing is you start by mimicking that satellite signal. And then the way these receivers are designed, they are designed to kind of track a particular signal. So, like uh, because remember the signals naturally vary be because of like people walk in out there is sort of shad shadow of a building things like that. So, they always latch on to a signal and try to track the peak of the signal conceptually. So, what the adversary does in this case is that it starts by uh, mimicking uh, the signal and then comes close to the real one and then it gradually increases the power and then the receiver um, because it always try to track sort of now latches on to the incorrect signal. So, the valid satellite signal is still there, but it is a lot lower power and once you got get the receiver latched on to your signal, the stronger one, now you can begin to manipulate it. You can basically begin to put fake data and also that now you tamper with the uh, uh, the conclusion is uh, reaching. So, you know, firstly the signal format and all itself are well known, so you can mess with that. But even otherwise, other thing you can also do is you can just delay the signal, right? I mean, one one of the one of one of the things out here is that the GPS receivers are actually trying to monitor, uh, measure the delay. Uh, so, if you can just basically conceptually capture the signal from the satellite let it sit in memories for a short while and then replay it, then voila you have enhanced the act sort of the perceived distance from the satellite and since uh, the whole system depends upon measuring the delays and then what the distance was, you have artificially introduced as if the satellite was farther away than it is and given the speed of light and all, it does not take a whole lot of um, delay uh, that you need to add to make vast differences in the um, uh, distance that you would have. So, that is what uh, this figure is trying to show that the adversary which is kind of the red dotted thing starts out with a low signal, gradually increases the power so that it is basically now overlaps with the uh, valid signal and then it begins to increase the power and the receiver uh, are designed to keep to just latch on to the, uh, they, they, they basically track the peak. So, uh, so, so that is the spoofing one and this one is the so called meekening attack, the second one that I was mentioning where basically you take the legitimate signal, you capture it, digitize it, capture it, make it go through some hardware usually done using these FPGAs and then just replay it out. And the thing that you also have to make sure is that you prevent the valid receiver from receiving the original signal and that is easily done because we can jam the thing. So, we, we jam. Uh, and meanwhile, we capture and then we replay at a later point with a stronger signal strength. So, uh, so these attacks are called meekening. You can mount it with G on GPS, but you can mount it on any system which is being used for localization uh, in some shape and form.
So um, these kind of things have been done, uh, like for example, uh, you can lure UAVs into uh, uh, into uh, into an area where they were not supposed to be. So I mentioned that as an example. People have demonstrated that they can divert ships and all. Um, you can, in theory, at least cause um, you know, bombs to be dropped in the wrong place and things uh, and things like that. Uh, there have been um, uh, lots of. Um, uh, allegations that uh, these things are being practiced and all. So, uh, most countries do not have their own GPS or similar system. So, they basically rely on the civilian bands of the three or four main systems that exist. So, they are basically at the mercy of um, uh, these, whereas like the US Army for example, since it has exclusive access to the, uh, uh, to the military band. So, it is kind of other than jamming which of course, everyone is subject to they are at least uh, immune to, to the first order to the spoofing kind of things. Uh, uh, so, there are things like that. There are also uh, defense mechanisms that uh, so, it has been a hot area of research in past let us say small number of years. Uh, so, you find these things where like uh, is it being spoofed. Uh, so, it turns out that adversary is still is still a fake signal. So, essentially it becomes a problem of detecting the fake. Um, uh, you for example, uh, out here like there is still that second peak. So, you can imagine if you had a better GPS receiver which was on the lookout for is there still that second peak existing then is something fishy. So, you are trying to kind of detect uh, uh, things like that. If we were designing GPS from scratch probably the best way to do it would be to uh, digitally sign the signal. So, that no one can fake you will still be susceptible to this delay attack. Uh, for which there is uh, encryption does not help I mean I am literally just um, it is a valid signal and all, but uh, at least um, pure spoofs kind of can be combated. There is also uh, even of even if all of these things go there are also other issues. So, I sort of mentioned uh, previously that the ability to uh, whenever a device captures uh, some physical energy from outside whether it is a valid radio packet or whether it is some sensor signal, there is always the potential that a poorly designed software can go into a bad state. So, this is an example of that, this is a GPS receiver just lift, listening to the GPS satellites and of course, GPS satellites have been around and they are very well vetted and all except that this GPS receiver um, um, had bugs in the software. So, in particular um, there are so called middle of earth attack. So, middle of earth the center of earth is basically coordinate 0 0 0. So, all sort of bad numerical stuff happens if you are able to uh, get the GPS receiver to think it is actually at the center of the earth. So, uh, in this particular case they basically generated fake GPS signals one which would basically result in the GPS receiver thinking it is at 0 0 0 uh, except of course, it is somewhere on surface of earth or above it. Um, and then uh, uh, because of some numerical problems in this particular case the receiver basically goes buzzer starts rebooting goes into a never ending cycle of reboots and stuff like that. So, this is an example where uh, they are exploiting a bug and um, GPS receivers are not tested for or things like that for those cases right I mean they are never at the center of the earth. So, that that was the attack vector out here. Then attacks on other sensors in the car. So, I have alluded this thing before also, but um, uh, since cars are incre increasingly reliant on sensors to perceive the state of the world around them. So, uh, that has become uh, a vector of attack and there are kind of uh, uh, several different scenarios that uh, one has to worry about. One is the attack coming from a neighboring vehicle. Another is an attack coming from an attacker on the side of the road. So, I leave some sort of offending device on, a, on the side of the road and cars which are passing by their sensors get fooled. And then finally, kind of the so called evil mechanic attack or a evil valet attack where the car is in possession of 
someone else for a while and then they surreptitiously kind of uh, do something to it. So uh, attacking cameras, um, this is where blinding attacks uh, kind of come into uh, come into play. So one um, one simple stuff simply is you shine a super bright light and kind of blind blind the camera that way. But there are more sophisticated ones which make use of the fact that these cameras have a lot of things like auto white balance and auto gain control and things like that. So they kind of react to conditions differently. So uh, what happens is when there is a sudden change in lighting conditions and all, all the circuitry inside the camera kicks in and it modulates its exposure time slash uh, other characteristics and it usually takes some time to recover. So in these attacks basically uh, they make use of these properties of the cameras and how they, ex how they react. Uh, so essentially at the critical moment I can uh, get the camera to essentially lower its uh, whatever turn make the aperture small or uh, essentially kind of blind itself uh, by sort of triggering it, triggering it into that mode and then remain there for a while. Same thing is happening with lidars. So lidars um, those of you who don't know is basically a laser uh, which using some means is used to scan the world. And uh, though some means in typically often include the laser itself is on mechanical gizmo and is moving around, but more typically the laser is fixed and there is kind of a uh, polygonal mirror and as a polygonal mirror rotates, the laser beam which is bouncing off that, that kind of moves around and that way you kind of scan the world and that would be a 2D LiDAR and if you have a 3D then you will also have some way of kind of changing the azimuth. At any given point in time you kind of keep track of um, where the which direction the laser beam is pointing to and then you measure the uh, return time and you measure the return time by kind of uh, looking for the return wave and then doing some uh, phase difference computation to get the distance. Okay, So what you end up with in, in LiDAR is an image where the pixels now represent the distance to the nearest reflector or uh, whatever something that bounces things back. So the output of LiDAR is really in the form of what are called as point clouds which basically say all these reflection points and their coordinates. So instead of presenting it as a dense and by an image, they basically give you the set of those points from which a reflection happens. So what you get is a set of XYZ saying at these XYZ there is some sort of a reflector present. So that is what LiDARs are and people are have been uh, trying to attack them also. So one is similar to <coughs> the cameras which is basically the saturation attack you shine excess energy into the sensor. So in this case uh, we shine uh, uh, light of the same frequency or nearby frequencies as the laser itself. Okay, So you do not need a laser you just need light in, 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 that, in that band. Uh, these uh, lidars operate in the IR band, so these lights are in any case uh, um, uh, not visible by the human. So this attack may get mounted, but you are not a driver won't uh, driver won't see it. Uh, so that's that's one example. By the way, uh, the reason the camera dazzling attacks work is for the same reason that these cameras, most of these cameras, while they are notionally op are in the human visual bands but they are also sensitive to IR. So even your regular camera is not advertised as an IR camera but uh, if you shine IR or um, on, on the other end also on the ultraviolet end, it, it, they are sensitive to it. So you can saturate the sensor by energy which is not necessarily in the visual band. So, um, uh, so dazzling attack is one. Another one is these kind of spoofing attacks, uh, so called illusion attacks and here uh, essentially you try to uh, generate the illusion as if there is a lot of reflectors out there. Um, crudely speaking like for example, uh, you can imagine I can have some sort of a reflecting dust be thrown in okay, and that will reflect and uh, give things. So there you can mimic these things electronically um, uh, as well. So uh, there are groups I think there was uh, I think this paper out of Korea. Uh, um, showed that uh, they beat the lidars and high end Mercedes for example. So these kind of attacks are being shown by the research community quite a bit. A more interesting one was knocking drones out of the sky with sound waves. So this one 
kind of builds upon something I mentioned a couple of lectures ago, which is accelerometers can pick up sound waves, right? If you recall that, it could, but that means they are sensitive to sound waves, which basically you can take it to the extreme, which means that if I have lots of sound energy, then the accelerometer reading can be corrupted and drones make use of accelerometer to uh, for navigation purposes essentially for, for uh, kind of a dead reckoning kind of thing. So, what this work again out of a group in Korea showed was that by blasting sound at the drone, they could basically corrupt the inertial measurements they were making for its onboard uh, navigation. Now, it is a little bit artificial in the sense that they need to be pretty close and the sound levels have to be pretty large. Uh, so, uh, settings under which you can pull it off are a little bit tricky, but um, at least in under some scenarios one can imagine doing this. So, uh, so that brings me to an end on kind of what kind of things people have been doing in vehicular environment. So, drones and cars and other such things are kind of um, uh, examples. Uh, some other stuff I have seen uh, fooling, uh, I think I mentioned this earlier also fooling rain wipers in the cars, this, 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 this kind of things. People have found uh, uh, bugs in the uh, entertainment unit software and therefore, by transmitting on some nearby AM FM band and you could inject false data uh, and cause problems, particularly these radios which make use of data coming from over the FM signals to get the traffic related data. So, that is the vector of attack, these are all unprotected. So, becomes become uh, these, these, these things therefore, become possible. So, that is on the vehicle side. The third one I want to cover is industrial control systems, which have um, uh, which have again be, uh, been attacked a lot mostly because they are uh, they control all sort of critical systems that our society kind of depends upon. So, they come in all shape and form, pipelines, refineries, traffic lights, um, train, train locomotives, all, all sort of stuff. So, as a category they are quite uh, diverse and traditionally they have been designed really for uh, efficiency and safety and not adversarial. So, like they, they try to take care of errors and noise and those, 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 those kind of things, um, uh, but several different events in um, recent uh, years have kind of made security also become a uh, top level concern. And what changed the game was that a lot of these systems when previously they used to be just disconnected from the internet inside a closet now are all on the internet often times. Uh, uh, their vendors log into them for maintenance and upgrades and things like that. So, uh, so that is one reason and the other thing is that if you are able to mess with them, uh, you really have a large scale footprint in terms of an attack, right. I mean you bring down a uh, something in a power plant for example, you are kind of causing problem for <laughs> large, large regions. So, uh, I mentioned uh, in earlier previously also these the systems are called SCADA systems, supervisory control and data acquisition, but essentially what they are is that the, there are the embedded computers. So, those are um, uh, those little boxes which might be controlling uh, robots and things like that, uh, uh, but then at somewhere at the back end are these server class machines typically kind of uh, uh, PCs uh, uh, some Windows software and what not. Uh, where these devices out there are made by companies like Siemens and Johnson Control and all that, and just specialized in again embedded systems, equipped with sensors and actuators and all, and running kind of these uh, simple control programs. Uh, and they have gone through sort of various generations um, where kind of their programming became more sophisticated, they became more connected, uh, the human machine interaction has become more uh, more sophisticated. Um, nowadays, like I said, they are internet connected. So, over time they have gotten pretty, pretty sophisticated um, and there is a segment of computer science community which kind of works towards uh, various aspects of various aspects of these systems. So, currently if uh, we are kind of in this generation where these systems are highly interconnected and make use of pretty sophisticated stuff. The uh, problem though is that uh, they are also pretty uh, 
simplistic and have been have proven to be easy to attack. So the programs on these systems are basically look very simple. So conceptually, the stuff which is running out at the edge is simply the following. Start scanning the sensor. So at the beginning, it just reads all the sensors. And it does uh, some processing on it, and then it updates the output to the actual so Typically, the program itself got just very simple things. They're operating at some 20, 30 millisecond loop. Read sensor, do some validation, process it, dump the output to the actuator, and then go to, go to the next cycle. So they're very, very conceptually very simple. But uh, uh, and 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 there are therefore kind of specialized programming languages around it. There are a uh, bunch of sort of different kind of vulnerabilities that have emerged around them. So first, kind of maybe starting from the last one. Uh, network vulnerability. They are basically for all purposes just like our other computers, so they are on the internet except uh, they tend to be much less well maintained and all. So, um, so they can be reached over the internet um, and if there is a search engine called Shodan uh, which specializes in that and then you can found on them to find vulnerability in the software and kind of penetrate them using the same kind of things that you really found. So some of the attacks have really happened on the SCADA computers and, uh, and then these PLCs. Then there are pla platform specific vulnerabilities. Um, so the processors on these systems and all are um, tend to be much less capable, more memory constrained and also kind of, uh, and also they're not updated that easily and also just generally kind of um, uh, more opportunities for vulnerabilities out there. And then finally, oftentimes, uh, the kind of systematic errors in the way they are operated, the policies and procedures in place um, to update the software, things like that, which go with them. So um, uh, let's see, I'm going to skip some of these slides, which are on the SCADA uh, itself. Um, and really, let's see. Uh, so, uh, so I guess the fact that these systems were uh, vulnerable was kind of well understood, but no one did anything about it until the Stuxnet uh, thing happened. And which, uh, as I alluded to earlier, uh, is uh, so basically, as you know, I mean, we currently see in the news also the whole thing around Iran kind of enriching uranium and kind of uh, UN sanctions and all which was. Uh, resulted from that. Uh, so, um, so Iran basically has been in the chain uh, which U.S. and Israel and some Western countries for this agreement with. So, some years ago, uh, one fine day, a lot of those uh, uh, centrifuges um, uh, were killed off by a software mean. So, what happens in the centrifuges? Basically, kind of a cylinder which rotates at a very rapid speed and because of the difference in atomic mass, the different isotopes of uranium, they kind of end up at different distances from the axis and then you separate them out. So, conceptually very simple. Um, uh, so, so what happens, uh, what, what happened in this case is that at some point in time, uh, it was penetrated by either CIA or Mossad or some combination thereof and then these centrifuges were run into dangerously high speed and essentially damaged, uh, damaged themselves and the operators didn't notice because the, their screen uh, showed the uh, okay. Now, the way the penetration was done, so it is not as if these centrifuges and all were sitting on the internet and people just logged into it. Uh, essentially, the initial penetration happened through uh, uh, a USB stick, but um, apparently this thing was not limited just to the centrifuge plant. It actually infected lots of machines elsewhere in the world because once the malware got out, it kind of did spread uh, somehow. So, for example, I read that um, companies in India were affected quite a bit uh, because they were using the same model of the Siemens uh, PLC unit which was there. So, 40 percent or so of the infections were actually outside Iran, including in the US. Um, uh, so, uh, what, so this was this was kind of a milestone in multiple ways that companies began to take it seriously and it also sparked a huge interest in research within computer science on how to 
how to combat these things and all. Um, uh, so in essence, what ended up happening was that if I go back to these SCADA uh, things, um, the block diagram, yeah, let's see. Yeah, these kind of systems. So essentially what begins to happen is that now they, uh, the, these computers were kind of the operators, the engineers who are running these plants and all, they kind of do this programming using those specialized languages and this program kind of gets pushed out. So they begin to create firewalls between that and the actual PLCs running and then any firmware which is being pushed and all is analyzed for safety and all. Uh, there is a bit of a cat and mouse game which has been going on. So there is a a uh, collaborator of mine who has been working quite a bit in the space uh, and some of the things that uh, apparently happen is the following. So for example, uh, have you heard the concept of honeypot, anyone? What what does honeypot do? What is the idea? Right. So, the idea is that if you track the hackers, uh, then, the, uh, uh, then, then by putting some attractive information, whatever s nuclear secrets or stuff like that, and then you can trace it back and then hopefully capture the hackers, right? I mean, that is kind of the intent. How would you design the, uh, now let us say you are trying to uh, uh, catch hackers who are trying to, I do not know, penetrate into your power plant. So, what would the honeypot look like? It is not simply just some files and all. So, the people, uh, these researchers are creating honeypots which look like a power plant. Uh, that is, they actually run a simulator there so that to the hacker it appears as if it's, there is actually a real power plant and all the controls and the necessary dynamics and all with all the realism that one would expect just in order to be able to do these kind of uh, things. So, uh, so these systems, um, the physical <coughs> model is kind of a very key part of the story also and for, so a lot of the security measures that you are doing, you have to kind of take, take, take those into account. Um, and that bit about that somewhere has compromised the firmware and it is headed to your PLC, you have to analyze. I mean, remember the program looks pretty simple, read sensors, do something, output sensor. So, structurally things look very simple. I mean, it could even be just a simple neural network, right? I have an input vector, I feed it through the neural network and I have an output and that output goes to the motor or whatever, the, your actuator. How do you prove or disprove that this program is correct? So, it is not as if somewhere it says um, you know, a line of code which says go and crash the system. It is actually the bug, the problem resides in those numbers and the matrices. Uh, so, there is a lot of current interest that these kind of systems where the underlying model is basically just something learned from data which where, where, where your logic is not in the flow of the program, but is in the matrices being used by your model. How do you identify safety or lack of safety, okay? Uh, so, uh, unsolved problems basically at this point, right? I mean, uh, so imagine I create a neural network which takes the sensor data and controls the steering wheel. Is it safe or not? Did someone manipulate the weights so that it will crash the car or not? These, 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 these things are very difficult to answer. So, a lot of work going around uh, around this kind of uh, stuff now. So, I think uh, that takes care of um, this aspect. So, generally industrial control systems at this point have become kind of a first order concern really because essentially it is um, uh, kind of uh, if, if, if they can be taken over then a lot of chaos can can be caused. So, that's the issue. Okay, so, that hopefully gives you between the introductory lecture and this lecture on kinds of problems that we are sort of facing at a high level. Now, the next thing I wanted to do uh, before going into some of the more deeper fundamentals of uh, CPS is I also wanted to talk a little bit about standard security. Uh, uh, in particular, what kind of things at this stage you can kind of take for granted, okay? Uh, crypto mechanisms, security protocols, things like that that exist, what current systems are able to use because in a sense that is your starting point. Um, uh, a well-designed cyber physical 
systems, embedded computing systems should make use of those things. And then we worry about the next set of problems which arise uniquely in CPS. So, this set of slides, if you have done an undergrad security course, you might uh, you in all likely would, would have seen something like this. Uh, so, bear with me because I know most of the students in the class have not. Uh, so, it is really a crash course cryptography in a nutshell. I, uh, Professor Dan Bonnet at Stanford was kind enough to share these slides. It is basically uh, lecture in his course also. So, kind of it is at the right level of abstraction. So, uh, but it will expose you to how do we formally think about some of the security issues and all in this context. So, what is cryptography? Well, uh, intuitively uh, we all know about it kind of encoding secrets right. Uh, it is a um, uh, great tool uh, uh, which uh, has turned out to be uh, so powerful now that a uh, lot of debate I think currently one of the big debates is really where should strong cryptography strike a balance between societal security versus personal privacy. So, the whole FBI versus Apple stuff which is going on currently. Uh, uh, but one should also bear in mind that it is only a part of the whole security thing. It does not really solve a lot of those problems I had in my list of security problems. This is uh, crypt cryptography serves a very specific purpose, but it is not kind of solves all, all or even most of your security problems. Uh, it is very reliable, we know how to do it very well. While there have been concerns about some of our security pro, um, crypto mechanisms not being quantum safe as in they can be broken if a quantum computer becomes for real, um, a, a, a quantum computer of sufficient scale becomes for real, uh, but they are otherwise to the first order pretty reliable unless implemented incorrectly ok. And that is a big unless that a lot of the time the problems are uh, uh, not implemented or not used correctly. So, both of them are important. So, just because we have the algorithm does not mean that uh, we are scot free. So, uh, so uh, what, what does security of a crypto system mean? Essentially, the goal that we strive for is that it should remain secure. Um, even if everything about the system is known except the secret key. So, there is a small amount of a small size. So, if I think of my data as having n bytes and I want to secure it as in I want to prevent others from looking at it, I have a key or whose size is constant independent of n and as long as I can keep the key secure and the other party can know everything, my algorithm, everything, uh, all the open source code and all except that key, uh, the system should remain secure. So, this is very important that the it other party is given full freedom to know everything about your system. It is a total white box type uh, thing other than like I said that tiny amount of key. So, common uses uh, secure communication um, where I am sending messages between two parties whether it is between a browser and a server or between two sensor nodes or a sensor node and some sort of server. Uh, so, basically it involves two things, we set up a key, a session key as it is called and then uh, and then we somehow make sure both parties know it. Uh, so, this is what happens at the very beginning of your SSH session or SSL session and then using that key we encrypt the data and then we transport it back and forth. Um, we also uh, the other place where we use this thing is for secure storage where the idea is is my computer my hard drive, but I am trying to protect against someone snooping into it if my laptop is lost for example. So, in this case sender and receiver are same and they are separated in time. So, in the so you can think of them as both are communication problem in the first case is communication between two parties over a distance at the same time in the other case is two communication between two parties or kind of the same party um, uh, at the same point, same computer, but at different points in time. So, symmetric cryptography is kind of the workhorse um, and what this is basically about is that all parties uh, who, who are authorized to know the information know that shared secret key and the algorithm is entirely publicly known. So, there is nothing secret about the algorithm uh, and this key is known to all the parties, but 
no one else so in particular if i have two parties then alice and bob alice is sending information to bob um, alice uh, and bob know the key and no one else know the key so uh, so what happens in this model typically is that uh, alice will take the message and the key k and uh, something which is called a nonce which is a random and then encrypt it using algorithm to get the c sends the c and nonce uh, and, and the nonce the nonce is just sent out uh, in the public so the c and n so okay, so adversary can hear c and can hear n but Bob decrypts this to the data okay. so that's very much uh, that's what what goes on um, um, what do you think we use this for? What do you think we use this for? Like, why not simply encrypt on end? Uh, yeah, uh, kind of. Yeah, exactly. So what you want to make sure is that for the same message, the cipher text looks different at different times. Because otherwise, I can begin to guess. So if you have seen that uh, Alan Turing movie, that's the one the invitation games, right? So remember, the first opening thing of the message that the Germans were sending was something about the date or something like that. It was a predictable message. And that's how they were able to do it. Okay, so, so um, <coughs> never uh, <coughs> one of the cardinal rules that for the same message you can never have the same same type of thing. And the way to so there are two ways of achieving. One is achieving the key every time, and the other is not. Okay, so that's uh, that's what not stands for. So two cases: single use key, um, which is for example being used for emails. Um, uh, there is uh, that case, no need for a nonce because I have a key for that email and then I just start the key and use the key. Another one is I have multiple users for the same key. So in this case, I have a session. I'm using the key again and again for multiple messages in that session. In this case, I should use the nonce. Okay. So uh, depends depends on how you are kind of using these things. Um, now, one particular extreme case of example of a single use key is a so-called one-time tag, and this is. Basic concept is that my key is some random string, and I have my message, and the key is as long as the message, and I'm going to just uh, change it. So finally, um, the cipher text I'm going to send is basically by XOR. Okay, so key is random thing somehow. So I updated this random text, but that's part of the order of the name, and then the cipher text. How do you record this? How do you go back from here to here? Next all again, right? I mean, next all uh, is the property. Okay, great. Uh, what's the disadvantage? The disadvantage is that I need a key to put as long as the message. So that begs the question that if I had a way to secretly share the key, uh, then I could perhaps have used the same way to uh, message. So there's a degree of impracticality. So what happens now is you distribute the key in advance, so like it could be like these cipher books, okay, or specialized devices which are synchronized, it can get the same random thing, okay. Um, so that's how it is, it is done. But generally speaking, it's very hard to have um, like uh, a true source of randomness and then effectively distributed because you're creating a list. Uh, if, 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 if I have to plan out as much of random bits, as many random bits as my message sending needs, then I have a bit of a problem. But in any case, this is actually uh, at, at some level it's a, uh, uh, it's a nice sort of thing because it provides what is called as perfect security. Because if I take a random string and then XOR it with something, the resulting string is still random. Okay, and therefore, uh, by looking at the cyber text, I'm really not learning anything about the plain text. Absolutely zero Right? So, the uh, key. Uh, appropriately random. So that's good. 
So this notion of perfect security begins to give a glimpse on what, uh, how, how do we reason about this. So, uh, so what we basically uh, say is the following that um, uh, yeah, so uh, some of it is mathematical setting so we can ignore that uh, focus on this thing if for all m0 and m1 belonging to the set of messages and for all c belonging to the set of possible cipher text uh, if the probability that encryption of m0 given k equal to c is the same as the probability that if I were to encrypt m1 using k and would have gotten c then we say uh, using some random key drawn from the set of keys then we say it is uh, secure ok. So, essentially what it is there is a nicer uh, formal way of saying is that really by looking at the ciphertext and not learning anything about this thing it is equal likelihood it could be any message from a Given that I also so it is it's, it's, it's a formal way of defining what uh, perfect security is. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, so it is perfectly secure in that sense. Um, the problem with this thing is that for this property to hold true the set set of keys I have should be at least as large as the set of messages I have right because uh, I cannot accomplish this. I can't achieve this kind of security without that property. So, this basically kind of just kicks the uh, can a little bit further down the road. So, key is in particular key needs to be at least as long as the message. So, how do we solve this problem? How can I have a smaller key and achieve something akin to uh, perfect security? Now, of course, I can't achieve perfect security that we have shown that the key has to be as long. So, the approximation that we end up doing is the following that uh, we take a small key and then we use an algorithm called pseudo random index pseudo random integer PRD and that gives us an expanded key which is what we use with the message and uh, then we get the second key. So, this is what this concept is used in what are called as key ciphers where they basically they take a small key and then using an algorithm they can basically generate a pseudo random number which we can use as if they were my uh, keys for a bunch like that. Okay. So, we have again kicked everything into this PRD and of course, bear in mind that uh, uh, there is uh, we, we have to make sure that output is sufficiently close to this algorithm with the properties and all. Um, so, so, we are basically sort of think, uh, put, putting the owners of the whole system be secure on saying this the pseudo random number generator has to be secure in some But that so we are mimicking one time pad but without having but basically just having a constant that C from which algorithm we are generating the necessary the necessary actual So uh, this this algorithm obviously has to be secure and efficient because if I'm sending data over a gigabit Ethernet would say then I have to generate those random bits at that gigabit bit also. Okay. So, uh, hardware support and all would, uh, would be needed. So, what we need then is a pseudo random number generator which is efficient, which is secure uh, and yet this has to be a deterministic algorithm. We are implementing it on our CPU. So, we cannot in turn say oh I have available to us some source of randomness. So, we cannot do that we somehow have to uh, do it. So, what does a secure pseudo random number generator mean? Um, uh, what a secure so, uh, in programming languages and Python and all we all have this function from the random right and um, it gives us a random value. Uh, uh, most of these things also have a concept of C right. So, you initialize the C and given a particular C from that point on you get a deterministic shape, right. This is how we make it uh, 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 sort of uh, debugging it all for deterministic shape. Right? Um, and usually in these systems we are satisfied with some loose notions of uh, randomness, right. We like, uh, should satisfy certain statistical properties which we associate with them. But security has a additional burden, right. I mean just because something has passes first, second, third order moment test and all that typically, 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 
still doesn't necessarily mean it's secure. A PRD, a pseudo random number generator, is secure if no efficient algorithm, if no efficient adversary can tell the difference between so I have the algorithm G. Uh, it takes in the input S and it computes the output uh, with the input So we say that we have a good algorithm, a secure algorithm, if we cannot tell efficiently that a difference between V of S, which is the output of our algorithm, and a truly random number. Okay? Uh, with the same number of S. Okay. So essentially we are defining it in the same right. I mean it's good if there is no way for me to tell, and I know I think it's very possible to tell, that it's not a random number. So the way we can think of this experiment uh, in this case the following, um, that I have uh, uh, I have a, um, yeah, so there are sort of two experiments being defined out here. I have party A, uh, 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 and the challenge. And essentially, uh, what we are trying to prove is that um, the algorithm is secure. So, what we would like to prove is the following. In one case, what the challenger does is the following. Um, uh, so, it basically sends an output of uh, the algorithm, and in this case, the algorithm is secure that we draw a C from the set of C. Uh, and then uh, uh, we run through our algorithm and take the output and we send it to the adversary. And what adversary has to do is, it has to tell me whether which experiment I'm running, whether I'm running experiment 0 or experiment 1. In experiment 1, I actually have access to a true random number generator and uh, I send it out. Now, how much I get the true random number generator? There are ways. One can imagine that there are higher sources of randomness depending upon quantum phenomena and things like that. So there do exist ways to get things which are random in that sense. So I'm basically going to compare them. So in one case, I literally take the output of our random source and I send that. In the other case, I take the output of the, I, I randomly select the C, so, uh, but this, uh, and then I take the output of that. Uh, it comes out and the adversary, if it can distinguish between these two scenarios, that means we are not secure. In particular, the adversary, and, 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 oh, and by the way, any number of such experiments are allowed. So the adversary job is to be able to distinguish If it can do it, then it's no longer secure. So, um, uh, so now what happens? So, uh, a lot of uh, random number generators that you might encounter uh, in our uh, uh, usages and particularly in E courses with like linear feedback check register and stuff like that, they look random for purposes that we might be after, but they are not random in this sense of security. So, in particular, uh, these kind of structures that uh, in our courses we teach, they are not. Uh, things like random in Python, random in C, and all are not uh, uh, secure. So, they were designed for. Um, being secure. So, uh, never use them where you need to generate uh, a random number in a, in, a, in a security setting, if you will. Okay, so uh, uh, some uh, supposedly secure algorithms have been broken. So, there are the categories of RC4. China. So these are, and the problem is that uh, uh, they all. Uh, it turns out that there is some bias that results in some predictability, and then sort of you can. You can, uh, you can uh, so what we need really are PRGs, which are secure and also efficient, right? Because we are using uh, in, in in those stream ciphers, we are using them in a manner where I need as many random bits as. Um, uh, as the size of my message, right? So, so, uh, and then there are a lot of other examples like uh, Professor Puneet Gupta and Sudhakar Pomarty in the EC department. Uh, they have been creating these neural networks where, uh, for reasons of power and efficiency and all, 
their whole system relies not on the traditional way of implementing arithmetic, but using something called stochastic uh, numbers, stochastic representation of numbers. So, they need lots of random numbers and uh, they keep generating like they need it every time uh, for every bit in every number which is flowing through their system. Uh, so, they use these uh, uh, sort of analog random number generators scattered all over the chip. So, if you can afford to create hardware random number generators and all there is obviously one, one thing to, uh, these things you can do, but even then they may not be fast enough. So, this hunt for a good efficient secure source of uh, thing. So, one way of achieving security is if it was truly truly random right because that is a fundamental test and so dependent upon some quantum phenomenon. Can you think of some other ways like if you were told to design let us let us forget the issue of the rate. Let us say I tell you you know write a piece of code which generates a uh, random number on your computer uh, and of course, as I have shown those trivial things like the feedback separators and all those things work. So, what sources of randomness that you can you think exist on a computer? Current system time in microseconds is not really random, right? It has to be some other thing which is random, right? I mean, if I were to simply read periodically my current system time, then it's actually very, very predictable. Remember, I know how often I am reading, right? So, you are kicking the ball down because then you are going to say, hey, I am going to read that system time, random time apart, but then you need a random number for, for that. So, that does not work. You, you, you get my point, right? Yeah. Okay. So, what the water? Why do you think that nothing is random? Power the power consumption, why is that that? Okay, so then what you are really saying is that what processes <coughs> are running the process? Is that true? Uh, it can be, uh, but you have to be very careful. So, some stuff about computation is not random, uh, indeed. So, one thing, for example, people use is arrival time of network packets or pressing of keys ok. So, there are external events which have random properties uh, although <coughs> so, so, some randomness can be extracted from it ok. Um, you can have analog circuits, uh, linear diodes stuff like that which have randomness uh, which have like random noise in there ok. Um, you can extract randomness from uh, noise in that your radio is playing or noise that your sensor is sensing, right. So, there are environmental sources of things that you can do and then you amplify it. Right? So, the, the challenge though is that all these things that you are studying do not create randomness at a very high rate, ok. So, usually sufficient number to then use as a seed for a good PRD algorithm. Okay? So, what I have to be careful about any predictability means that is a vulnerability, uh, yeah, it will be broken. Ok, so need fast uh, PRGs uh, and there are a whole bunch of these um, sort of things that currently exist um, and the hunt kind of goes on you will still see papers on low power efficient high rate PRGs for embedded systems and for processors and things like that. Intel processors um, a lot of these processors actually have a randomness source on chip and then they provide some instruction for reading it ok or and some some algorithms uh, some, some instructions to help implement the PRG. So, uh, so that support is provided because without that just imagine every server which booted at the same time would basically have the same same property right it will produce the same key and also you uh, so there will be a lot of determinism there. So, what you want to make sure is two machines even if booted at exactly the same time proceeding the same way if they if you were to ask them to generate a random number here and a random number here at the same time they should result in different values ok that is that that property has to be there otherwise you will have predictability ok. So, uh, 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 so now uh, let us move towards um, uh, kind of uh, 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 
so we have the random generator uh, random number generator uh, secure random number generator prg using which i can create that stream cipher and then use it as if it was a one time pad and then i will have something which is kind of like my perfect security right but uh, uh, what is the notion of security which makes sense for algorithms okay so let's sort of dwell on that a little bit so uh, ciphers which are sort of about it our definition of uh, uh, perfect security where we basically said whether it was the probability was the same whether it was m0 or m1 here we have passed it into this kind of game where the job of the attacker is to say uh, which message is encrypted and if it cannot distinguish it efficiently okay by and by efficiently we basically mean that point in time uh, if I do that then my algorithm is okay. that's that's how computational notion of security get uh, 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 get uh, get defined. So, and then within this context, you can also define um, uh, how much security advantage that exists uh, in one party or the other. So, long story short, a cipher, an algorithm, is called semantic to be secure. It's for all efficient adversary. The advantage that the adversary has is many. Okay, so the efficient adversary who can break. Uh, the cipher in this sense. Okay, now uh, some things one has to be uh, careful about, and so uh, remember that one time pad. Now, uh, if I use the key, uh, the re it is called one time pad or ring. If I use the same key, either in a one time pad or a string cipher, uh, again, then you run into the following issue. I have uh, one, which is message one uh, plus some, uh, uh, and message two plus some. If I take an XOR of C1 and C2, if these two keys are the same, then they will cancel out and have a the XOR of C1 and M2. Right? And what that would mean is that wherever the two messages were the same, I would be XORing the same bits, and therefore I will see a zero. So I can begin to get. I'm, I'm learning something about the message, okay. right? I, mean, I can no longer assert that we were not learning anything. Now, I so you can actually, um, uh, this, is, this is why if the same stuff gets sent, you begin to learn something about it and you take part. So never use this in a stream cipher setting, you can never use the same key again. You have to just keep uh, generating new ones. So stream ciphers for a variety of reasons, including the one that have to generate these things at a very high rate and all are therefore used less commonly than what are called as block cipher, which is really you know, the workhorse of modern cryptography. Uh, so the way it works is the following. Uh, uh, I have n bits of text that I want to encrypt, the message I have to send, the data I and uh, I have a key and into uh, uh, encrypted algorithm, encrypted, uh, encrypted cipher text, and uh, it operates on n-bit blocks. Okay. Uh, so, canonical examples of this until 
Commonly nowadays, you'll use AES-128, although if you want to be secure, probably you should use 192 or 256. So, uh, so how, how do things uh, 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 work? Uh, so, <laughs> under the hood, um, uh, if again, if you, I mean, yep, some of you have seen that imitation games and all, and it talks about this. Enigma machine from Germany and it has these rotors and they kind of wire them up and stuff like that. All these crypto algorithms deep down essentially have some concept like that. They rotate the bits and mix and match and all and in ways which I guess are beyond the sport, but probably it's very, but essentially uh, there are a lot of these so-called mixing operations and they are repeated multiple times and then uh, and this magic on the time we run by Formalized by IBM uh, long ago, uh, and use different things and of course use different versions of things. I'm not going to go into how these things work, but essentially it's a lot of big shifting and, and sorting them and rotating them and all those things. Later, long story short, AES 128 has kind of a next step which makes the like following, uh, which involves like a sort and some multiple functions, and then well, the key of that was AES um, they are very difficult to design, but there are apparently you know, proofs and all on like why they are robust to different kind of attacks that one can imagine. Uh, now, once you have this basic step, which can take uh, 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 take these uh, uh, sort of mixing step, then you kind of combine uh, these things to create the whole uh, um, whole whole block cipher. So again. Um, uh, out of the realm of this course, but kind of a Texas. So now let's say you have your block cycle. So it can take that n bit, take the key, produce that bit. How do we actually use it in, uh, use it in practice? So uh, one approach of using them is a so called electronic code And kind of the idea out there is that I have plain text, which is a file, or chop it up into those 128 bit jumps, apply to this. So I take this N1, and uh, so let's say this third 128 bit block was N1, and I'm going to encrypt it with the C1, and I'm going to send it out. And uh, the problem with this, as you might imagine, is that at some point in time, the same N1 will repeat again, and therefore I'll have the same C1 again. So if I were to use the block cipher, my AES operator, in this manner, then I will be I'm basically reusing the key. So same message will uh, be encrypted in the same manner, and therefore I have a problem. So this approach of electronic code book doesn't work. So if you have a long message sent, and let's say your system provides AES instruction or AES hardware, um, uh, you should not, must not use it by saying, hey, I have the key, and each block I'm going to just encrypt using that key and send it out, because sooner or later the same method will be and things will get broken. So, so that doesn't work. And you can see it play out uh, very well. Like, let's say I have an image, and that's a plain text. I encrypt it, and I don't know if you can take out, but actually it is encrypted in the image because the hairs are being encrypted the same way. And you can actually see the face kind of play out even the way. So, so it doesn't work. OK? So, so ECB is out. Uh, so to use these block ciphers, to use this thing correctly, uh, what you uh, need to 
do is um, uh, what is called as a counter mode with uh, what is called as a initially rated factor or render initially rated factor. So basically what happens is as follows um, uh, that, uh, uh, that I will take this initial initialization vector and uh, I will take my messages and chop it up and then I'm going to inject using my algorithm initialization vector, initialization vector my point, initialization vector and so on. So I will take this ID and I will keep incrementing it and every time I want to encrypt it using keep incrementing it and encrypt it using ID. So remember, this essentially gives me a random number and each one of these things are the same. And now I'm going to explore it and I'm going to it. So the consequence of this is that even if M0 and let's say M3 has the same bit pattern, they will be encrypted. Now for this thing to work, what should I be careful about? Uh, I have to make sure IV is not guessing. Right? That way, um, otherwise, again, the whole, uh, 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 sorry, the same ID doesn't get So one has to be very careful. Uh, so my advantage is, okay, I can do all of this stuff in parallel. All these messages can be done in parallel. So okay. So how to select IV? Uh, single use IV. Generally, the recommendation is to use a fresh random ID for the new So, but the main thing is the ID should not be used. Okay, so, other common one is just start up with the transmute and the system. Uh, I think uh, the Wi Fi standard, uh, which was broken in the recording last time. Something to do, I forget what the process is, but it's uh, something to do with the way we were collecting the IDs. So that's, oh, the IDs were rolling over, but still to come here. And that's all the issue up there, so that within a short session, you will see the ID rolling over, and then you will take some of the data. So, so that's the idea out here. So, in this case, if you were to use the counter mode, you can see the here. So, uh, so resist the temptation of counter mode. It looks appealing, but it's actually flawed. Okay. Uh, so Intel processors, as I mentioned, have uh, uh, these things built in uh, the support for AES, and therefore they can uh, process the data at a pretty uh, pretty high rate. Um, and uh, also uh, on the embedded side, uh, the radios tend to have AES built in. So usually there is a crypto unit which allows for basically they call it a crypto unit even though all it is doing is the AES operator. So uh, because many of the standards which are used in IoT radios like Zigbee and all they all require um, uh, AES basically. So, uh, uh, so, so there is hardware support for it. So stepping um, uh, stepping back now, so so that's kind of the practical view, right? I mean, there is, uh, if you if you were to just take a utilitarian view, what should you do? Use AES, don't implement your own. Use the one which is provided, and then use the not the ECB mode, but rather this counter mode, and then find a way of selecting. Uh, so, like when your system starts up, maybe select a, uh, in a random initialization vector, and then after that, just implement it by one. Okay, so. Uh, so that's that's kind of the basic approach. Uh, now, um, from a more abstract perspective, the way sort of we reason about these uh, these things and all uh, is in terms of. So we saw pseudo random generators before. So uh, now, how do we think about uh, what is happening with these block ciphers? So block ciphers are thought in terms of a couple of concepts. So one is a pseudo random function. So essentially, it's a function which is defined over three sets k, x, and y. Uh, so the pseudo random number function f takes uh, a tuple k comma x, and then it produces a y. 
uh, and uh, there is a efficient algorithm to compute this thing. So, it can efficiently take something from k, something from x and map it to something from y. Uh, there is a special case now called pseudo random permutation which takes something from k and x and produces something from x. So, it maps back to x and again um, uh, and it has these properties it is efficient this function is 1 to 1 so that everything in x maps back to x something x and so therefore they also reduce the single So, you can constantly see we are kind of trying to build up the encryption and encryption uh, The encryption part takes k comma x uh, and puts something in x and the decryption goes the other way around. So, typically in these systems my cipher text and plain text are really coming from the same same set. Okay. Uh, and so you can think of this function as a permutation. I'm taking if I want to order the set in some manner, then what this function is doing is just jumping it up, but in a one to one fashion. So uh, so that's why it's like you know like permutation. It's permuting uh, yeah, okay. So uh, so uh, 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 there is a concept now defined called secure PRF. So, remember in case of PRF uh, it is a function. It's a, uh, so, I have uh, uh, <coughs> goes given a P goes from x to y. So, now let us imagine all possible functions that exist which the set of all functions will go from x to y. Right? I can have two sets x to y. I can always define uh, I can think of all possible different functions which go from x to y. And then, uh, if I consider the set of those functions, which uh, those functions f, um, uh, which uh, where k is at a particular value, then uh, then this function f k and uh, uh, is really going to be one of the members of this set. Right? So, so the functions, uh, the pseudo random functions that we are talking about, they are being drawn from the set of all functions which go from and you basically say that a PRF is secure uh, if a random function drawn from this set of all functions from x to y is this indistinguishable from a random function in the set of x. So it's kind of uh, to ponder over it, but intuitively what it is saying is that if I select the T randomly, it's no different than I, if I were to select a random function from all possible matters. Okay. So, even though I am dealing with a much smaller set function, so the real set of all functions, I basically by just selecting the key randomly, I am essentially getting the same type of randomness property as if I was doing an arbitrary random transformation of the uh, So, so it is secure in kind of that sense, where you know, I can again just think of it as a game where adversary either follows category 1 and picks a truly random mapping to the x and y or follows category 2, selects a random key and then selects a random function from the set and then use that to do the mapping and uh, the fact that we want to do the from the So, uh, these security analysis are all always in terms of done always in terms of these kind of uh, this, 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 this kind of games uh, where you can basically uh, define that there is a challenger which is following one of two strategies. So, this is following one of the picture, it will follow strategy 0 or strategy 1 and strategy 1 so it just picks a random function from the set of all possible functions going from x to y and strategy 0 it first picks a t and then it picks a random function from just that subset of functions which is going from and the assertion is that the whole thing is secure if an adversary who is allowed to provide an x and then down for that and it can do it multiple times. Okay. And the strategy is fixed. So we fix the strategy in the beginning. So at the beginning we say challenger is using either first strategy or second strategy, but of course unknown to the attacker. And the attacker is allowed to have as many queries as it wants and it's going on the okay. so effectively we have uh, security equivalent to as a like truly arbitrary mapping. Okay, so uh, and with that you can also define now the secure random permutation which is basically again saying that 
either it could be the set of all possible permutations from x to x1, or I can pick a key and only pick those permutations which are allowed. So, um, uh, so if I if I have a block this if you can see it's like a, a PRP is a block cipher, right? The block cipher takes something from a set <laughs> and remaps it to another value in the same set. So what we want is a good block cipher is one which is a secure PRP. And um, and the assertion is that AES is a secure PRP. Okay. Um, so um, and and, and that's what kind of crypto courses and all cover. Main takeaways I would like you to take um, uh, get away out here is that uh, you can always think of security in terms of different things. That is, what is compared to this idealized notion of security? The mapping was truly random. What am I achieving? Uh, uh, be very careful about defining some of these things. What power does the adversary have? What the source is? So the reason we call it computationally is we are basically saying that adversary is computationally efficient. Then we can do it in reasonable time. So uh, it is uh, polynomial time. Okay. And what all knowledge it has. So for example, in this case, what did the adversary not know? Adversary didn't know B. And therefore, it means, uh, and of course, uh, therefore, it means know what strategy will be used, and of course, I will use obviously also the right? But uh, but adversary is allowed any number of ways. Uh, it can keep pinging, but of course, it has to be efficient, so it can't just do an exhaustive search over it. Okay, and the other thing is, what be very clear about what is the goal that the adversary has. Um, that is, we should be unambiguously able to define. What does it mean for the attack to have been successful? Uh, so that's uh, uh, very important. So, uh, so these two things: what what is the adversary capable of doing, and what does it want? Uh, and any security problem, you should have clarity on this on, on these on these two questions: what what resource is, what knowledge the adversary has, and what is it trying to do, and then show that relative to some idealized setting, you are so when we say you have to prove the security of your mechanism or your different mechanism, basically you have to show that the attacker, adversary, under your chosen defense, does not have any advantage uh, over you know, the defense. So, uh, and in particular, uh, therefore important that this is where things differ from noise. We don't care about average case or anything like that. We really are trying to prove what is happening in the worst case out there. Okay, so with AES 128, you can secure messages very well. So solve problem, but the part which we don't know is where are the keys coming from. And the other thing is, what can the adversary still do? So now what we have shown you, thus let's say we have taken care of the keys. So, so we have a secret key, I can send you the message uh, and you can decrypt it and adversary cannot look at the message. But what can the adversary still do? Okay, huh? to infect the identity. Uh, what? Corrupt the message. Yeah, it can tamper the message. So that is what this section is known. How do we make sure that the message that you are getting? Because look, uh, since the AES one twenty eight uh, simply goes from X to X, right? Just a secure PRP. Uh, pseudo random permutation. So, I can replace it by any bits and you are going to get some bits. Okay, now the thing is maybe you are expecting an English message, so it may not make much sense in English, but maybe I can encrypt, uh, replace the message you were sending by my own mess, uh, so, so um, you know, by, by, by doing a replay type or things like that, and I can corrupt things. So, data integrity becomes very important. Okay, so how do I make sure that the message has not been corrupted in front of So Really, what we are after in secure communication is both these properties: confidentiality and non-tampering. <laughs> so uh, that's a job of what they call as Max. Um, so uh, message integrity is uh, really uh, the place you encounter the most. Is I have some code posted on GitHub, and I want to make sure that uh, 
phone has not been tampered there's been no notes or photos and uh and if i digest with the security that you uh check out so again just as a code again in our communication courses networking courses and all often you would see things like crc and checksum and all which claim to do something similar they claim to let you detect corruption of bits in the message but they are not secure okay it's very easy to reverse construct things which will meet your crc or checksum test but so what you have to be able to show is that an adversary cannot replace the message um and pretend as if the message has been done so to maintain message integrity you need something much stronger than checksum okay so so the basic idea is that now when we send the message we send a message along with a tag and this tag is generated by taking the message together with a secret key and then subjecting it to some kind of a tag generator so i'm going to make a tag using the function s using the secret key k which i don't really don't know but i don't have to know and uh, i have to get a secret and then the other party is going to verify that the message is good by taking a k which is already known and in the tag and the answer of the function is going to be yes or no so that's what uh, this uh, conceptually uh, this thing now what we want is a secure map right uh, so as i said you could if it was simply this uh, uh, these this this kind of things Uh, so, so one difference relative to CRC is that we are we have introduced the concept of a secret key in normal CRC. We just do it over those bits and all. But you could imagine that maybe I could do a CRC with a secret key, but it would still be weak, okay? Uh, because the algorithm is weak. So what we want out of a secure MAC is the following, uh, and it's called the chosen message attack. Um, so basically, uh, the attacker has a bunch of messages. M1, M2 through MQ of its choice, and for each one of them, it queries the uh, it queries the uh, it it's allowed to look at what the tag was produced. So it could be like maybe the attacker fooled the sender into uh, sending out a particular uh, message that the attacker uh, created, and therefore attacker is now able to see what that what the algorithm what tag the algorithm generates for each one of those messages. and what is the attacker's goal the attacker's goal is that it would like to generate a new message n comma t with x synthesizers and for this we have a message so we would basically like to be able to create a fake uh so n comma t uh and n comma t should not be in the original message right otherwise so uh so uh if you think about it uh, uh if i uh, uh i mean some of these things that we read about like the same and things like that some of them would not be possible if infrastructure to do integrity checks and things like right imagine the uh, hot exercise every time you edit an image and all then the output image carried over something about who edited it and how then that provenance chain would be there and then you will not have a deep fake type problem so all right i mean but but uh, uh so this is really to prevent the folding okay so now if i have a secure trl so previously we saw secure trp gave us which is what aes was related secure trp gave us uh, uh, a way of uh, achieving the uh, getting the configuration <coughs> a secure trl <coughs> excuse me <coughs> so a secure trl can give us a secure message in the code so the idea is that if i have a secure trl Uh, remember, TRF goes from X to Y under a key. So take the key K and uh, if you just use that as a sign. So if you take a large message under a key and map it down to uh, 
code. And then uh, the verification function, all it will do is it will take the message in, it already knows the PK, and it will see that the that's a tag T, which is the same as the tag So it also uses the time function. It attempts to resign the message and say, okay, I'm getting the same. So if I give you a PRF, then I will all I, I will have a mechanism to provide this secure message authentication code. So how can I create uh, uh, how can I create a, a secure PRF? Now our building block is that AES one twenty eight or basically a secure PRP. Uh, I already have and remember what secure PRP is, does is uh, or AES128 does is it takes you know, 128 bit maps to 128 bit or like the block produces a block. So one approach is uh, uh, the So I take my message, let's say my code file, and I drop it up into and then I take M0 and encrypt it. Okay, using so this is my AES128 and then I take this, XOR it to the next one, and then again it this. And this is the same. Okay, so every time what I'm doing is I'm taking the output of the previous case, XORing it with the current block, and testing it, and keep doing it. So this is called uh, uh, and at the end I get a tag. So that tag in this case I will have to make my AES and it often gives me a and give me that and that's my tag that I'm doing. So at every stage I have a constant size output and I just try to do so accumulating over about five. And uh, uh, so so that's that's the, uh, that's what uh what I'm talking about here. Um, the final stage, we uh, uh, take this and then we re encrypt it with the NLP, uh, K1, and then uh, that's what we So I can use the same stuff which our hardware provide to now uh, construct a way, uh, construct a message authentication code. Uh, so, uh, and, and, the, and the reason uh, um, uh, this last step is done is. Which is, uh, uh, <coughs> without this, there are, there is some <coughs> so that final stage is important as well. The other approach which is used, and this is a more common one, is something called HMAC or HashMAC, and this is the one which is most widely used. So you often hear things like SHA-256 and all, and uh, these are cryptographic hash functions. Um, uh, and like SHA 256 produces an output which is 256 bits wide. So, uh, so how do these HMACs work? So that's the other alternative. So one is, if you want a, a message authentication code, use this. Construct yourself using uh, AES. But the other one is to use this um, uh, SHA 256 or an, another one of these hash functions. So, what are hash functions? Hash function is any function that can take data of a target to inside and map it to data of a pixel. So, for example, any of you ever use hash functions in Python or any of these things? Where do we use them? For what for uh, think of like yeah. lookup table, right? So, why do we use them? So what avoids going to Okay. So why do we go to a hash function? Why can we just you know, say, okay, I have a message one to hundred and if I now want to map it to ten, so I'm going to take the first ten and map to the first one, second ten and map to the second one. Why do I use hash? Yeah. 
distributed right so my original indices may be clustered maybe all even though my space may be 1 to 100 but maybe most of them are sitting in 1 to 10 so if i do my type of trivial hashing then it will all go to the first bin and that's not good so the hash functions you tend to use also tend to have this randomization property that is distribute things around you know. okay that's that's the important property that after right so hash map in particular or dictionary tick in python and all they basically kind of rely on you know. so 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 what on the strictly speaking i mean uh, any function which basically takes a larger space and maps the smaller one to the hash function but it's not a good hash function for those data so the values written by hash functions are called the hash values and um, so, but it's not a good from our perspective. It's a cryptographic hash function with a special subset of this, which has certain properties. Uh, and the main idea is that it's a one-way function. That, uh, that is, it's infeasible to convert. Which basically means that, given the it's uh, uh, it's very hard to construct a message. Or construct the larger value whose hash would be that. Okay, it's very hard to go the other way. Provably very hard to go the other way. So the idea would be that in my input, let's say, box, we call the cryptographic hash function, and get some value. Even a tiny perturbation out here will result in a huge computer perturbation out there. And moreover, um, if my goal is to uh, uh, generate another message whose hash is the same. Hard. Super hard. Okay, so it's a one-way function. So we, are, so it's a hash function still, and of course it's a good random hash function. I mean, it's real, but it has this additional property of non-invertibility or whatever. Uh, it not, it cannot be inverted efficiently. So that's that's what we want. So, uh, SHA-256 um, uh, kind of um, looks like this, I will not go into details. Um, interesting story behind this, so this first name out here Merkel, uh, Merkel um, was a, eventually a researcher at Xerox PARC, the kind of the famous lab and he came up with something called Merkel trees and he came up with these things. Uh, the interesting story behind this is the following, he was an undergrad student at Berkeley and as part of his course project actually came up with these initial ideas which led to this stuff, so, put it as a course proposal, the <coughs> professor did not like it, thought it was all wrong, rejected it, happened also when he attempted to publish it in the ACM magazine, uh, ACM communications of the ACM and then of course the history is that he turned out to be right, okay, so even undergrads produce great stuff. Um, uh, so, uh, so in any case, uh, SHA-256 is based around, um, uh, based, uh, based, based around uh, that. Um, I'll not go into it, but again, uh, in, in, into in, into into these details. But the main thing is that it's the workhorse thing. Uh, basically, uh, data presentations available, JavaScript library, Python library. So you basically, and it's part of the internet standard RFC. Uh, so using this HNAC function is pretty much the way what should go around a good solid thing, preferably one of these one of these standards. There are other ways also. This is another one where um, call up sort of you combine these, uh, uh, you do things in parallel, um, uh, but again they exist. So now, what does secure communication mean? Secure communication therefore means that um, you should be encrypted and authenticated. So it's encryption plus a message authentication. So, uh, so we have seen <coughs> how to do both. Uh, I think multiple ways of seeing how to do both. Um, you would have a key for encryption and you would also have a key for authentication. Now you have two options. One is I can first create the authentication tag okay, and then encrypt the message that the tag to okay. This is what SSL is. What we have to see is not that So conceptually it looks like this, there is a message end. I first create the 
code for it, let's say using XMAN, and then we instruct it on this interface. The, the option two is encrypt the message. So in this case, I have a message. I encrypt the message, and then complete the authentication code for it, and then send the uh, encrypt the message and the authentication code for the message. Uh, there's an option three, which is encrypt and make. But by the way, this is used for IP. The third one is encrypt and net. So in this case, uh, what happens to the following um, uh, that uh, I'm going to uh, have a message, I encrypt uh, the thing, and then we send out uh, the encrypted message plus the map of the political these are the three options. And it turns out that uh, this option is the best one from a security perspective, both option one and option two actually have vulnerabilities. So your good strategy really is you have a message, you encrypt it, and then you compute the text for the interface. Details as to why uh, it's not an all you can uh, Google and kind of read up on your own. Um, so I'm going to stop out here because there are only four minutes remaining. Um, and I, the next thing I want to talk about is public key crypto uh, because that's the complementary thing. But very loosely, um, as I referred to earlier, the idea in public key crypto is that there are two different keys, uh, encryption and decryption. You one uses key one and the other uses other key. These two keys are carefully designed to have some ethical properties. Uh, and using this, we really solve the problem of how does, how do we distribute, how do we generate those secret keys state on the okay, because that's the step that we're not talking about. So using this, we kind of keep that code. So we'll discuss that and speak for a few seconds.